Hello, everyone. My name is Marie Lamanche. I work at the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies uh, here in Canada at Concordia University. It's we have we're having our first snow. I feel so. Welcome, Winter. Um, welcome to the workshop Vectors of Hate, Speech uh, and Incitement at Prosecute Prevention and Social Media. Um, if you're having technical problems, uh, you can write uh, to the technical support team via the yellow chat box. So after some introductory comments by myself and by the speakers, we will go on to questions from the audience. Um, and then um, I'll be able, I should be able to see them in the chat. Um, I'm delighted to moderate this discussion with Mrs. So Sophie Ackerman, a co-chef de projet Stop Hate Speech, and Christopher Tuckwood, whom I know well, he's the executive uh, director of the Sentinel Project. We've been collaborating um, for, for quite a while. Um, first, um, I'd like to say some comments based on the work that we're doing at Mix, perhaps. Um, you have all seen or heard about Frances Hogan's um, Facebook whistleblower. Um, her testimonies are shining light on the violence uh, and instability in countries such as Ethiopia and, and Myanmar, and long held concerns that social media have a role to play in, in, in this violence. Uh, she said recently, we saw uh, in Myanmar, what we saw in Myanmar and are now seeing it in Ethiopia are only the opening chapters of a story so terrifying that no one wants to read the rest of it. She warned Facebook that uh, the platforms, I mean, so that, that the messages on the platforms were basically um, inciting um, ethnic violence because uh, the platforms was not policing its services adequately outside the United States. Um, but what happens uh, when a population in a fragile country relies on Facebook on its main source of news, um, as we see in Myanmar? Um, how do social media perhaps encourage so, uh, so, uh, divisions instead of connecting people as um, developers in the Silicon Valley first um, envisioned? Promotion of violence online leads to real world violence and if we want to be serious about atrocity prevention, we must take this player into account as we uh, come up with new strategies to prevent genocide and mass atrocity crimes. So in today's workshop, our speakers will discuss how governments and tech companies have failed to protect citizens. They will also talk about their work because uh, Christopher works in various parts around the globe. And I know Sophie, you're a young organization. I'm looking forward to hearing to what you have to say. Um, I will start with an opening question to the speakers. Um, let's start perhaps with Sophie. Sophie, thank you for joining us today. Um, I just have a few questions for you. Uh, where are uh, tech companies and governments currently failing in terms of hate speech and social media? Why are certain regions or communities more vulnerable uh, to using hate speech on social media? And how should tech companies approach hate speech on social media in different regional contexts? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you also that I was invited to speak here uh, today. Um, so to say, Alliance F is not quite a young organization. We're over 100 years old, but it's new that we also like lead in technical project, which is very um, interesting for us as well. Um, so yeah, I also try to give you a bit a context of Switzerland and what we're feeling um, because we're seeing that hate in hate on the internet becomes a bigger problem. And it's also hitting Switzerland quite hard um, in a country where we live in a, in a direct democracy, which means that we can vote um, <clears throat> on changing of laws every few months, phone on the social media and comment section on newspapers has become so harsh that a lot of politicians don't dare to speak publicly because they're so afraid, um, not just on hate on the internet, but also offline hate, which very much um, goes to the heart of our constitutional state. And in Switzerland, we also made, made a greater commitment on the part of the politics. And I would like to explain briefly how I um, see this. So hate speech is clearly a global problem, but it also needs a national approach. And um, in our project, we're trying to um, make technical solutions, but also try to work with the civil society. We have seen that when trying making an algorithm to find hate speech on the internet, that already in Switzerland, as a very, very small country, we have problems because 
there are many different continents which have different cultures, which have different um, different language they use. So it was al already for us very hard to have one algorithm working for Switzerland and not just talking about people speaking French and German, but also in the German part, it was not that easy. So I can't really imagine Facebook trying to find one algorithm working for so many levels on globally. And it's not just a recognition of hate speech. I also think that every country has its own values. For example, we in Switzerland, we don't have as much problem with nudity than maybe the US. And we're always very, uh, we don't, we find it every quite weird when um, Facebook deletes pictures, which we think they're totally okay with our values because we're just having very different standards. So what I want to say here is that I can understand that the world wants to hold social media tech companies very much accountable. And I support that in many technical ways, but I also think that we as citizens, but also as politics in our, in our countries has a responsibility we have to take on. And I think it's very much irresponsible to give the tech companies a big part of the democracy of the democratic decisions uh, to decide what content is okay and what not. Um, you have just talked about the Facebook files, and we heard there that um, Facebook is powerful enough to extinguish whole movements. We have seen that in Germany they took down in few weeks a militant COVID skeptic group in Germany. And um, that was interesting to see and to learn that they can do so. But imagine when they decide tomorrow that they want to take down the whole um, women's movement. <laughs> what do we do then? So it's just their decision. And I think this kind of decision has to be made democratically and also transparent. Um, in addition to that, as countries, we all have different ideas about free speech. I think um, we in Switzerland, we have a quite liberal law. Many statements are not punishable, um, which I think is something we really have to work on in Switzerland, because there. But there's also content which is may not ever be illegal or punishable, but still harms the democracy. Um, so what I would suggest is that we, as Switzerland, we need clearer, stricter laws to tackle hatred. But there is also need a better understanding globally. What is hate speech? What do we want to see on? on the platforms. Um, there needs to be transparency on the part of tech companies, and we need to know what they classify as hate speech and what they don't classify as hate speech. I think what we would need is a dig digital ethic committee, and I mean that globally, but also on, on the national level. If there are like if there are cases which are not as clear that they can discuss this transparently and open. But above all, it also needs a lot of commitment of the civil society to show civil courage. And I think we all have to be very active on the internet. We have to go against hate speech. We have to do counter speech. Um, with our projects, we're working with the best research in Switzerland and we are currently investigating which types of counter speech is proven to be effective. And in three weeks, we will publish our first paper in the very respected journal, um, which we could have shown that counter speech has influence. There are also different kind of strategies which are promising. So this much I can say with not saying too much, um, it works and we all have a voice. And if we all stay up together, I think we can always make it. From my side, for the first. Thank you. You're, we're, <laughs> we're all looking forward to look at you reading the paper now. You've, you've given us a, a good, good, good arguments. Um, Christopher, I basically have the same questions to, uh, to you. And I know you've worked in regions across the world with the Sentinel projects, including Kenya. So um, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's difficult to compress all of this into just um, five minutes. So I think maybe during the discussion later on, some of my other points will, will come out depending on what people want to, uh, to talk about. But I will say that uh, fortunately, Sophie has addressed a lot of the issues that we often consider ourselves uh, to be quite challenging, um, or at least, you know, adding complexity, things like differing, um, differing attitudes towards these issues in a lot of different contexts, but also um, just looking at uh, the diversity of languages around the world and then even within languages regional differentiations um, you know 
even within within English, uh, I'm sure we could think of examples, uh, you know, of words that might be considered offensive or statements that might be considered offensive in one country, um, but not in another, like the difference between, you know, the UK and North America, for example. Um, so that, you know, I think that really argues in favor of things like um, trying to incorporate as much human knowledge into into technological approaches to this issue. It's probably worth me taking just a moment to back up um, and kind of explain to people why it is that for us as the Sentinel Project, looking at hate speech uh, is a relevant uh, sort of thing to do. So this is important for us because our focus on assisting communities that are threatened by mass atrocities and and you know, ideally preventing that kind of violence from happening. Uh, it's it's very important that we understand the various different factors that lead towards um, that kind of that kind of violence. And of course, anyone who you know, as I'm sure, basically everyone participating in this conference is aware, um, you know, hate speech uh, and particularly hate speech promoted by people in positions of influence um, and inciting violence can be, you know, is a very important part of that process of targeting and dehumanizing a particular um, a particular group of people that eventually can uh, be transformed into actual physical violence um, offline in, in the real world, so to speak. So for us, it's a, a potentially useful early warning indicator when it's considered in, um, you know, in concert with a lot of other types of uh, data uh, and can actually be used to inform uh, interventions that prevent those kinds of processes from from advancing and ideally preventing violence from occurring. Um, but again, to bring it back to where technology is relevant, um, you know, this is a this is a massive uh, issue uh, and a complex issue. As we mentioned, there are the um, you know there are the the differences of, of languages and cultures and even within certain languages and cultures uh, just different approaches to these sorts of things from uh, one place to another even at very local levels uh, so technology theoretically uh, is is able to if we can incorporate the right kinds of, of human factors into it can really help to um, make this less uh, make monitoring for example, online hate speech, a less labor intensive process for uh, human moderators. But at the same time, we can't totally um, delegate this kind of work to, to software. And so I think, although we don't have time to go into a lot of uh, detail on it, it's really important to consider how those two elements work together, um, using human input to train software on accurately understanding a lot of those factors, and then using software to reduce the human burden on, on human um, or reduce the, the burden of work on human moderators and to inform um, decision making. So we need the two technology and then human judgment to work together. And I'll just wrap up by saying that there are some things when we think of governments and social media companies and what they can do, um, there are a few different things that I think could be very, uh, very helpful. Uh, so one point I want to make is that this is not an issue that we can simply legislate or regulate away. Uh, of course, there is certainly a place uh, in the world for, you know, legal, for example, legal penalties on the actual incitement of violence and that sort of thing. I don't think we, we question that. Um, but at the same time, because of concerns around uh, free speech and kind of slippery slopes that can, you know, as, as Sophie kind of alluded to, um, it can be dangerous and also potentially ineffective and arguably even um, self-defeating uh, sometimes to lean too much on the idea of outlawing uh, undesirable speech and um, and you know censoring and punishing uh, the people who engage in that sort of thing. So that's one thing um, I think we need to look at is how to use these kinds of approaches to actually influence um, uh, people's attitudes, uh, which really requires again coming back to understanding a lot of the different human factors including the relationship between hate speech and misinformation, and then the relationship between those two things and physical violence. Governments and social media companies should support more work on early warning, especially at local levels, and engage more with the actual affected communities that are um, you know, most likely to be targeted by things like hate speech and misinformation. So uh, I'll leave it 
pretty much at that. Um, just to, I just do want to recap that um, we really very much prefer the idea of uh, implementing longer term strategies that aim to address kind of root causes and a lot of the perceptions that make these sorts of narratives appealing to certain people, um, rather than taking heavy handed approaches that might um, backfire and actually increase polarization, especially when we're talking about potentially segments of the population that are already distrustful of authority, whether that's government authority or corporate, um, you know, corporate authority uh, in terms of platforms trying to censor them. So um, I'll, I'll leave it at that and uh, look forward to getting into this in more detail during the discussion. Um, to the audience, if you have questions, uh, you can ask them in the chat and I will lay them, but perhaps an idea for you um, um, would be, you know, we would like to hear from you, how should civil society pressure governments and social media companies to be more proactive in preventing online hate. But Sophie and, and Chris, um, I completely agree with you that, you know, policy takes time, so it will never be and, and the urgency of the situation that is, is now, um, I mean, looking at what's happening in Ethiopia, we need to act rather quickly. And at the same time, we don't want to leave it in the hands of the tech, tech, company, tech companies, companies, like you said, Sophie. So how should, how should surveil society, or in, and especially social media users, um, engage in this type of work because I because I we know that on so on on, on Facebook and Twitter uh, that it mainly promotes hate speech so how do we have enough messages that counter that hate speech considering the platforms prefer to uh, amplify um, 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 in, uh, inflammatory content perhaps Sophie first or Chris as you wish yes I mean which yeah, we just read um, a lot about what Facebook could do, and I think they know quite well what they could do, and they don't. They don't. So, um, I, I'm not an expert, so I will not talk about Ethiopia. I mean, I can just talk about what what we see um, and what we can do, and that was what I was trying to say before. I'm really, I'm, I'm. I know that algorithm working are working against us usually i'm really aware of that but still i'm quite certain that if everyone um which is usually the bigger part of society which is not hateful um on the internet would just get up tomorrow and like spend at least half an hour um on social media and try to combat hate speech with counter speech that the world would look like very different in two or four weeks actually um it's a bit the same the same argument um with voting you can say my vote doesn't count but in in the whole it does count so um for me it's a bit the same with counter speech what i really miss is civil courage what i see in switzerland if i go to public transportation and someone next to me is really racist you always have people saying up and saying no you can't do that on the internet i'm really missing out on that um, so I am a very positive person or optimistic that I think that we would have the voice to change that kind of behavior. Um, but I'm also keen to hear what Christopher thinks. Maybe he's a bit closer to, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have a lot to add in that regard. I think part of the difficulty, especially when we speak about um, Ethiopia, you know, you use the example of Ethiopia. Um, Marie, uh, the, the problem there, I think, is who, maybe a question of who is responsible for legislating and, or, you know, regulating whatever word we use, um, basically, you know, mandating certain behavior from a platform like Facebook. Um, because what I'm thinking, and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not overly familiar, to be honest, with how they sort of operate with regard to different countries and sort of the legalities of all of this. But Facebook is operating over numerous different uh, jurisdictions. And so, you know, do they necessarily have an obligation, legally speaking, I don't mean morally speaking, but to, let's say, apply these standards, you know, the relatively high standards of, let's say, a country like Germany when it comes to restricting uh, hate speech, 
in a country like Ethiopia, or, you know, from Facebook's own just sort of self-interested legalistic perspective, do they only have to worry about enforcing whatever the laws of Ethiopia are within or obeying the laws of Ethiopia within Ethiopia? I suspect that it's it's the latter and especially because the government and you know supporters of the government are engaging uh, from what i understand in this kind of harmful speech in that situation it's very unlikely that you know there's really going to be any pressure on on them to to do that sort of thing of course then there's you know the other question of social pressure um perhaps uh, you know just sort of people um in the general population kind of pressuring Facebook or, you know, Facebook's maybe sort of sensitivity to public opinion and that sort of thing, which might push them in a more kind of um, responsible position in the case of countries like that. But I don't really know, to be honest, how likely that is to be, to be successful. So I don't know if that really addresses the question. I think it would actually be great to hear from somebody in the audience if they have any, any thoughts on this. Yeah, I would like I would like to know as well and, and clean from the audience if if I have an impression that young people are more aware of the harms caused by social media than older generations, um, including here. Maybe because they grew up with them a little bit. Um, I don't know uh, uh, when I see a lot of the misinformation, it's 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 all the generation often that I see um, amplifying or retweeting that kind of, of, of thing. What, what do you think, Sophie? What, what is it like in, in Switzerland? Do you see young people particularly interested in, in perhaps educating or ed educating people about so their harms of social media? Are there all uh, yes. Well, I have a theory about, I mean, in Switzerland, there was always said that um, the only ones making hate speech is old white men <laughs> and i think it maybe has nothing to do with age and um but maybe more about the fact that they are more lonely than other people and more alone and what we have seen during covid and during lockdown that there were a lot of people being quite lonely as well um and hate speech has really rise a lot in the last month so i think it also has to do a lot with loneliness people not having um a social structure um seeing people maybe having different opinions and as that getting very hateful and violent and maybe they're also quite scared um i think that young people do know quite better but still um especially for the young people. Um, I, as a mother, always think that I should be the one um, behaving better, that she can learn how to behave. And so I'm quite scared that the young people will just think that this is how we behave and this is normal and this is how we talk to each other on the internet. And um, in that point of view, I think that we have to first start with ourselves and <laughs> um, try to yeah, be better people um, before we we point our fingers on the young ones but i think as they are really um yeah digital natives um they will have maybe less problems in um when we talk about facebook know what is real and what is fake um or at least that's my hope um but yeah sure i think that is a big discussion going on in switzerland that we have to talk more with kids with children with teenagers um, about hate speech, about bullying. It's not just hate speech. I think it's more talking of bullying, which actually um, the government is doing quite a lot against bullying, but not maybe against hate speech, which is very interesting. I think one thing I would, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to, to add, I don't know if this is necessarily helpful, but it might be worth just in all of this conversation thinking about what our end goal is in a realistic sense. So, um, you know, obviously it would be nice to live in a world where there were no such thing as hatred and violence and these sorts of things. Um, unfortunately, that's a fairly utopian sort of vision of the future. And it's not to say that we shouldn't always um, be addressing these sorts of things, but I think I don't necessarily think anyone in this session is prone to this, but sometimes the conversations that that we have or the things that we see people talking or writing about indicate that they feel like this is a problem which, you know, if we just find the right solution, it can be solved once and for all. Um, and that applies to hate speech. It applays to misinformation, you know, with the spreading of rumors. 
all kinds of things, which to one degree or another, I, I think are just a part of human nature. And again, that doesn't mean that they can't be reduced and you know sort of managed and that we can't work towards a significantly better future. Um, but we should just sort of, I think always keep that in mind that this is something that needs to be a long-term sort of almost a permanent um, part of our efforts as a, as a society. And even if we were to reach some sort of, um, you know, sort of beautiful future where these things didn't exist anymore, it's going to take a, quite a while to get there. And unfortunately for, you know, I think some people who have a more narrowly solution oriented approach, it is going to take a lot more than just writing a particular piece of software that is somehow going to solve the problem of all hate speech on the internet or writing a certain piece of legislation legislation that is somehow going to solve the problem of all hate speech in society in general. And so that's something that I think is, is very important to, to keep in mind. It's not necessarily the most optimistic thing that my, people might hear on the issue, but I think it is uh, an important, uh, realistic thing to say. No, I think you're completely right. I mean, you know, tech optimists often say that technology will save the world. And, and that's certainly not the case. We have seen that and we see that time and time again. And I know for a while when it comes to um, misinformation, hate speech, um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg said he was training an AI and that the AI would, would kind of deal with things and it would be perfect. And, and again, like you say, policy wouldn't will not be perfect either. But have you seen successful, I know, I know, Sophie, you have a paper coming out, so perhaps you don't want to reveal too much, but I, I would like to have perhaps examples of technological um, solutions that have worked or, you know, content speech that has worked on social media. Uh, yes, I mean, I can maybe just first say something about um, technology and how it will not save the world. I very much agree um, that this technology will not help. I think there is one big advantage of um, any algorithm. If we manage to make algorithm as transparent as possible, uh, you can really see why people decide um, and or why, why software decides and how it decides. I think um, usually we think that um, the machine will make a decision which is not fair, but usually people also make decisions which are not really fair. <laughs> so I think if we would really manage to have an algorithm which will ban every um, regional specific hate speech on the internet, that would be better than having people to look through. That was what Christopher said before. It's also quite cruel to let people go through a content which is that much hate hateful. But, um, <clears throat> um, about strategies, yes, so what we did, maybe to explain shortly, is uh, that we made a Twitter experiment where we tried to um, counter over a few weeks every hateful comment we have seen in the selection of people um, over a few weeks, and we tried out three specific, um, met three specific um, methods of counter speech, and that was humor and empathy and the third one was um, warning of consequences not um, on a law basis but more saying like could you imagine that also your boss would read that and are you aware of that that it's like open the internet and it's actually not that much um, crazy that empathy really works so not empathy with the person who wrote hate speech but empathy with the people the person harmed and actually there we really saw significantly that people um, deleted their tweet and stopped tweeting for two or three weeks, which is very interesting to see. And it's actually quite nice to see that actually love beats hate. So if you're just empathic enough, it will help. And what we're doing now is that we're having a much bigger sample. And over the next weeks, we will um, redo the same. In, in Switzerland, we try to find every hateful comment in Twitter Switzerland and combat it or make counter speech and also try to find out if there are different kind of empathy which could help even more um, and we're actually very keen also to publish it and to give it to all of the world and to try um, what we try to see whether it makes a difference or not but um, yeah what we also always try in our project is to bring a little bit 
um, yeah, to connect also science to see whether what we do has any kind of impact and if we are on the right path, actually. Yes. Yeah, that that all makes a lot of sense. I think something that I would I would add, you know, Sophie mentioned trying to encourage people to have empathy with the targets of hate speech, and that's a very good thing to do. I think at the same time, I wouldn't necessarily call it empathy um, in the context of what I'm about to say, but I think something that is missing for for a lot of people, unfortunately is the desire to have a good understanding of why people who engage in hateful, hateful behavior do so. And I've, I've encountered this maybe more so in personal sort of conversations versus professional contexts, although sometimes also in professional contexts where a lot of people I think confuse explaining something with excusing it. And so, you know, if we want to sit down and say, why does a white supremacist, you know, have a certain viewpoint and really understand why they think the things that they think. Um, you know, some people are very uncomfortable with that um, because maybe they think that by explaining it and by trying to understand that person, uh, we're somehow saying that that what they believe and what they do and what they the ideas that they promote are are okay. And that's not the point. But it, you know, if we want to sort of persuade people, either, either as individuals or collectively, to have a less, just to put it simply, a less hateful worldview. We need to understand why they see the world currently as they do and why these kinds of narratives are are appealing to them. And I think in that case, since Marie, you had asked about success um, stories, this isn't necessarily techno, uh, you know, a technological success story. And in fact, it, it's a much more sort of narrow um, thing, but there are several examples of, for example, people who have left behind uh, extremist movements of one sort or another, whether that's white supremacists who then become anti-racism, you know, campaigners, for example, uh, or even don't necessarily go that far to become, you know, opposed to their former ideology, but just leave that extremist community and return to a more sort of normal life, so to speak. Also, we see, of course, people leaving like Islamic extremist um, groups and uh, that sort of thing. And so I think, although those are individual and arguably anecdotal cases, if we look at people like that and try to understand their experiences and their stories and what was it that ultimately changed their minds to leave behind a very, you know, a life committed to hatred and potentially violence, um, and go to you know the complete opposite extreme of that in a, in a positive way, then perhaps there are insights that we can derive that would actually become scalable um, to to a larger society. Whether that is technologically, um, you know, facilitated or not, I think remains to be seen. But I, I do really think that that's that's critical. Um, and I think a, a point to make. Uh, I don't know if you know, where this uh, kind of particular wording came from, but something that we sometimes say in our team is that nobody is irredeemable. Um, you know, I think there often is that viewpoint. Um, some people get almost into a sort of like good and evil mindset when we're talking about issues like this and the, you know, so-called evil people um, are seen as being inherently evil. They're just, they're born that way and that is their nature and they, you know, never will change and therefore they should be shunned and shut off and silenced and, maybe imprisoned or what have you. Um, but ultimately, all of these things that we're talking about are just ideas. And, and every person is, you know, just to one degree or another, just an empty vessel into which you can put, into which good ideas or bad ideas can, you know, can, can enter. And so I think we just need to, again, understand better, how is it that these extremely bad ideas take hold? And then how can they be changed? Yeah, I actually yeah, very I'm much agree with... so. If I, yeah. if I just may, um, I think we also have to shift like our, our view of having um, the bad guys and then the victims because, um, yeah, I agree. I'm also sure that people who are stuck in that hate are not quite lucky to be there. So they are not people which are, um, has chosen to live a, a life full of hate and probably also be scared a lot so what we also try to find out for the next experiment is is there some kind of exactly what you what you try to articulate like maybe not empathy with the with the person writing but like still trying to like 
find out what exactly um, has led him to be there, which is very, very hard in a tweet. And we also have to be quite careful if a person is really racist, we can't say, yeah, I see your point, but could you maybe say it in a nicer way, uh, which is not always possible if it's just too harmful, but we're actually just trying to figure that out if there's a possibility to at least um, research that kind of uh, behavior. Yeah, two people in, in the chat here really welcome the, the empathy approach. And I have a question from Lisa Rutnik. Uh, tech companies have uh, various strategies available to them to slow down the flow of um, disinformation and hate speech, for example. Do you think it is possible to identify a meaningful threshold when such approach should be activated? I know that when the January 6th uh, insurrection in Washington happened, they made the decision rather quickly or well kind of <laughs> or do you, uh, before the uh, before the elections as well yeah that's a good question um i'll answer i'll try to answer briefly but i think maybe sophie will have more thoughts on this um i mean i, I can't really say you know yes or no this is definitely possible uh, it's always difficult to i think quantify uh, these sorts of things when it comes to human behavior but in theory, I would say yes, yes, it is possible. And this is where I think we need to, to learn more. And I'm always uh, sort of hesitant to argue for, um, you know, more, just more research uh, kind of for its own sake. But I think this is potentially very actionable research and is something that could be, um, you know, learned about in the context of also doing useful uh, sort of interventions, so to speak. And this is this is a bit of what I alluded to earlier when I said that we need to understand the, the relationship between hate speech and misinformation, which I think are often considered, you know, as discrete phenomena, which they are, but there's a lot of overlap um, often between the two, but then also the relationship between them and offline violence. It, you know, especially for us, our interest in that being as a, as a useful part of an early warning system. And maybe that's kind of what, what we're talking about here in, in relation to Lisa's question. Um, Again, I think that would be difficult to quantify and come up with, you know, some sort of scoring system or something like that, where we say when it hits 65 out of 100 or however it would work, then it's time to start sort of like restricting um, the flow of this information on, on social networks. But um, in theory, it's possible. I, I think also, unfortunately, to go back to some of the questions or points that we both made earlier, um, that is partially like very contextually and culturally determined. Um, so what, you know, what that threshold might be in the United States is probably going to be different from what it would be in, you know, somewhere in Europe versus somewhere in, in Africa or between different, you know, countries on either continent versus a place like Myanmar or something like that. So, you know, it's, I guess just in short, I do think it's theoretically possible, but it would be difficult and complex for a variety of, of reasons. But Sophie or, or Marie, what do you think? Yeah, I very much agree, um, especially what we say. I think the idea is, is actually very good, but then we have to see that there are a lot of, it's always a question who who would be in charge um, and of, yeah, who would be in charge? And I think there are a lot of countries which are not very democratic. And when when could they be in charge of what they want to see and what not? And um, I think there is such a difference in what we see as free speech and what we see as hate speech um, that it's quite impossible, I think, globally finding um, a benchmark which we all agree on and what what's going to happen. So that's why I say that we, I know the internet doesn't stop uh, at the Swiss border, and I know that we have crazy influences from Germany, Austria, US, wherever. Um, but still, in the end, we, I think, we need to find quite um, nationally um, solutions which are, which are fitting for us in that right moment. Um, but that's what what Chris said before, and that's maybe the pessimistic part, I think there will be no easy way or easy fix or easy solution. Um, but I would really, I think, really, again, um, starting 
we're trying to bring the tech companies to give us some insights on what they decide and what not would be a good start. Um, yeah, so we could also decide maybe globally, but also nationally, um, whether we have to change our laws to make like, them accountable. Genocide prevention, like it's it's we we can't arrive with big mandates that all look the same and because it, it is so contextual. And we've seen, for example, whether it's the case of Myanmar or India or Ethiopia, companies like Facebook failed to have a proper local team that knew the language, that knew the culture, that knew the um, political divisions. And that's what we need. So I also wonder whether there can be true also collaboration between these big tech companies in the Silicon Valley that have no knowledge about what is happening in other countries in the world, because that's not their background, their technologies, their engineers, and then local civil society groups. And instead of, you know, have proper collaborations and not just top down, just, just either bottom up coming from the country itself. Um, uh, because there are a lot of people in Myanmar who said, yeah, we knew this is wasn't going to happen. We've been warning Facebook for decades, for, you know, for, for months about these, the, the, this online hate. So uh, make sure the companies listen and then a proper collaboration mechanism that I think would be finally interesting because right now the companies, and I, I cannot, I mean, if Facebook is investing a lot of money in, meta, in the metaverse, it can invest in Myanmar. So it's, it's a bad excuse. Yeah, I, I think something that maybe doesn't get discussed enough, and it's, you know, this isn't really a, a, some, an idea that I've developed very deeply, um, but it's something that I don't think, yeah, is discussed enough and maybe ought to be, is whether or not there's an actual business case to be made for companies like Facebook to do this. Of course, we talk about, you know, the moral and ethical arguments, which are important, obviously. Um, we talk about, you know, so there's just what they should do, regardless of whether or not they want to. Then we talk about like legal, you know, legislative and regulatory sort of approaches to incentivizing this kind of behavior. But ultimately, you know, these are, you know, we're talking about private companies whose primary goal is to generate a profit. And regardless of how we might, you know, different people might feel about capitalism and, you know, that sort of thing, that is that is what they do, and they actually have a legal responsibility. Um, but, you know, maybe a conflicting legal responsibility, but a legal responsibility to to do that to the best of their ability and generate the most profit possible for their shareholders. And so, perhaps there's a different approach that we need to to take uh, sometimes to talking about these issues. Is there an actual financial, you know, incentive, arguably, for doing a better job of um, you know, making Facebook, just to keep using that as the primary example, a less hateful place. Um, perhaps perhaps there are. I, I mean, you know, anything that I say right now about how or why that would be the case would be purely speculative, but I, I do think there's something, something to that. At a certain point, letting their platform, you know, become just a, you know, a, a haven for this sort of um, online behavior could be damaging to their own business. And I don't, I don't know, like, I, I just truly don't know whether anybody at Facebook is considering that. But if they're not, that might be a different avenue of, of advocacy to start taking with them. I think there are maybe for, in the United States or Europe where we have other platforms. But if you look at um, developing countries that, you know, where people rely on Facebook and Snapchat and, and WhatsApp and stuff like that for their business, for example, when Facebook went down for like almost a day, a lot of, uh, you, you know, in, in, in the US we were, or, you know, North America or Europe, we were kind of laughing, but in, in, in other countries, they could no, lo lo no longer sell their goods, for example, because it's, it's a banking mechanism, it's an ordering mechanism. So if you only have one or two platforms, it's going to be, I mean, yes, I mean, it would be great to have a business incentive, but these people can't necessarily go somewhere else uh, to do that business. Yeah, that's a very good point. When there, when there is basically a monopoly like that and people don't have an alternative, then Facebook has to worry less about users leaving to go, to go elsewhere, uh, at least in the short term. I mean, in the longer term, 
it is it is difficult perhaps for a lot of people right now to imagine a world without Facebook. Um, but uh, the truth is no company, no matter how large and successful it is, lasts truly forever. So depending on the time frame that we're talking about, I mean, Facebook does does face a risk there. And also, you know, I, I mean, we see especially in with technology companies, the, the rate historically at which they are sort of uh, supplanted by new companies that come out of nowhere and do whatever they're doing better, even if they are a monopoly, you know, it's much faster than it is in other types of businesses. So, um, yes, I think that everything that you're saying is right, especially in the sort of short to medium term, but longer term, I think that Facebook could still face risks in, in that regard. If one day something, an alternative comes along and people just decide that Facebook isn't the place for them anymore, which generation, generationally speaking is actually already happening. Um, you know, like a lot of, you know, much younger people these days, at least in Western countries are not really using Facebook anymore. There are other platforms that they prefer. So I don't know. I, I think that's relevant for us to all, all consider as well. But I think that's also very interesting. Um, at least Switzerland was always very aware that there are a lot of rules that not just one company can get to, to that status of having that monopoly and like having that much force. And I think that's also um, a danger, at least for us, that maybe also our politicians um, or the ones deciding are A, not very diverse and B, also maybe not um, very digital so they don't they don't know they facebook was something people just yeah posted pictures and had fun and at some point they just missed a point what to take it serious and now we are at a point which no no one knows what to do anymore um which i also think that we also have to educate our decision makers to to know what they're talking about how it works and also to see I think finally take it serious that it's not just something we do on our social time, that it really affects every part of our life. What you said, Marie, that's also, I mean, sure, we don't maybe rely that much on Facebook, but still a lot of also young people um, rely a lot. Um, a lot of friends of mine, they have their shops on Instagram and it works quite good as long as it's here, um, but also get to know the people that how and what kind of system they work, but yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And I think whether it's you know, generally generationally determined or based on other kinds of demographic or social factors, you're right that oftentimes the decision making on these kinds of things is, you know, rel relatively narrow and doesn't necessarily indicate a, a good understanding of how these technologies are actually used by most people on a day to day basis. Like a a similar example, I think, to what you just mentioned comes from Uganda, where, um, you know, platform, as in many African countries, um, you know, platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp are very important for a lot more than just uh, social um, and sort of entertainment based purposes, which might be something that the government didn't quite grasp properly when they decided to put in place a so called social media tax several years ago, which, you know, for especially people at the very bottom of the economic period, or pyramid rather, um, you know, suddenly made, suddenly introduced a, to us a trivial, but for them a very significant additional financial cost just to using something like Facebook or WhatsApp. And like that had a very, I think, negative effect on people's abilities to, to do a lot of things and access information and interact and access services maybe even that otherwise they were. And because you know, I think the decision makers really just viewed this as kind of like a, an entertainment sort of thing. Um, yeah, so anyway, that was just to add another sort of example of, of that happening. And I think- When my colleague and I created, created the, de sorry, when my, when my colleague and I created the, uh, or lab to look at what social media, how social media could contribute to hate speech in 2013, people kind of laughed at us because they only saw it as, a, an, as an entertainment. So we know that, you know, and also looking at COP26, we know that the solutions don't necessarily come <laughs> from the top or the ones we gather in Glasgow. Um, I have another question from the chat. Uh, should we have actionable parameters, parameters uh, of hate speech known to be dangerous? Um, I guess that follows kind of the, the discussion as well. When should we, when should we intervene perhaps? <laughs> 
Sophie, do you have thoughts on that first? Yeah, I mean, I I would really much. Um, I mean, the UN has kind of parameters: what is hate speech and what is not. Um, then the European Union has different um, parameters: what it is and what not. And then Switzerland has none. Um, so yes, it, I think I would actually really much like having um, may, maybe more intense. Um, discussion also with civil society, maybe more sensibilization, talking really to people all over the world about what is hate speech, what not. Um, I think in the end is what we said, it's it's quite difficult um, over all regions and um, we also have to make sure that we as Western European countries doesn't tell other people what they have to see as hate and what not, but that's a different discussion I think. But I think we would really have to make more intense discussions um, and make more headlines on newspapers that people really think about um, what they want for as, as a society, as a democracy, what they think is good dialogue, what they think is good discussions. Um, but as I said, I think it really starts um, on a very private level um, already. And then sure it's good if politics find one way or the other having um, more or less a framework of what is hate speech, what not, and how, what could we do together against it. But there should be a lot more money invested in sensibilization, if you ask me, actually. I, I would add on, um, in terms of whether it's possible to determine parameters like that and, and what they might be, um, you know, like the example in Jennifer's question of senior officials ordering people to go out and use specific violent means against a defined stigmatized population. That's a very, you know, that's a very clear case of um, not just hate speech, but incitement. And I, I think this, there are two relevant maybe things that I would add here. One is that this is kind of getting more into the concept of dangerous speech versus hate speech, um, which isn't something we've really talked about, but I think is a useful concept um, that other people have have worked on and promoted, which is basically that you know hate speech is is one thing. Um, you know, the average person just sort of expressing hostility towards another group doesn't necessarily, in and of itself, um, present a danger of offline violence. But when that same sort of viewpoint is presented by a person in an influential position, whether that's a politician or just you know a, a, a famous person or a, a media um, figure or something like that, that is a very different sort of thing, especially when it includes a call to action that might incite violence. So I think that's something that we need to look at, differentiating between dangerous speech versus hate speech. But then also another thing that I mentioned earlier, which we're interested in looking at more, is the relationship between hate speech and misinformation or, or rumors. And the reason for this is that we see typically hate speech, so not dangerous speech, but just, you know, that sort of simplistic example I shared of a person, you know, going on the internet and saying, I hate people from, you know, community X or whatever. That in and of itself doesn't necessarily, in, won't necessarily inspire somebody to one day just go pick up arms and spontaneously attack somebody from another group. However, what it does do is, I think, generate a sort of general, we can call it background noise of hate that starts to change the atmosphere and make the concept of hostility and maybe violence towards another group like that to seem more acceptable um, or perhaps even desirable. Then where misinformation kind of comes in is we often see it as being a, a triggering sort of um, effect because misinformation and rumors typically are about they're sort of action oriented or focused around a, a threat so let's saying you know a particular group of people are doing or about to do a certain harmful thing at a certain place and so when something like that comes along and it comes into that sort of prepared atmosphere of hatred it's a lot more likely to trigger violence so the sort of you know quote people seem to like from one of my colleagues is that um hate speech loads the gun, but misinformation pulls the trigger. And I think, and that's all the more true if that misinformation is promoted, much like with dangerous speech by people in positions of influence. So I think those are all different things that we need to start looking at more as well and understanding those relationships. And, and having that more, I guess you would say, holistic view is probably what's going to 
guide us towards being able to identify these kinds of parameters and thresholds where we know that we're getting into truly dangerous territory and more perhaps drastic measures are, are required. Um, great, thank you, Christopher and Sophie. Um, we'll wrap up here. Thank you to the audience too for their questions. I know the team is gonna share some of the main takeaways of, of this session. So thank you very much for, for your insights today.